Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming this morning. I'm going to be talking about the influence of hygroscopic flare seeding on the droplet spectra in southeast Queensland. I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors, Courtney Weeks and Rulof Brunchies. This work has been done as part of the Queensland Cloud Seeding Research Program. This program was initiated by the state government of Queensland in response to a drought that the region had been experiencing prior to 2008. We were there for two field campaigns between December 2007 and March 2008, and then again between November 2008 and February 2009. As you might be aware, if you've been reading the news, they are now experiencing dramatic flooding. But at the time that we were there, their primary dam for water storage, Wyvenhoe Dam, was down to 17%. It is currently well over 100%. Um, but our mission at the time was to assess the feasibility of cloud seeding to enhance rainfall. And we worked with a variety of partners um, from within Australia, South Africa, and the U.S. For the field campaign, we had a variety of innovative facilities available. We had the CP2 dual wavelength dual polarization radar. It was located here just to the southwest of Brisbane. We also had the Bureau of Meteorology radar network radars available. The two closest into the region were the Mount Stapleton radar here along the coast and the Marburg, Marburg radar further inland. The Mount Stapleton radar was a Doppler radar. In addition to the CP2 Doppler radar, we had dual Doppler coverage areas here outlined by these um, black circles. We had ground-based uh, raindrop distrometers and a research aircraft. Our research aircraft was capable of seeding with hygroscopic flares, and it also had cloud physics and aerosol instrumentation. The key instruments that I'm going to be discussing one way or another in today's um, talk are the um, FSSP, or Forward Scattering Spectrometer Probe, measures cloud droplet spectra of about 3 to 47 microns. We also had a cloud imaging probe and a precipitation imaging probe. These two probes for this particular research we've used to help um, identify regions within the cloud that might have been influenced by rain falling from above. And so we've used the, these probes information from them to exclude measurements where we did not want to have any potential rain contamination. We also um, had some aerosol probes. We had a, a cloud condensation nuclei counter, a differential mobility analyzer, and a passive cavity aerosol spectrometer probe for measuring aerosol spectra. So we conducted a randomized cloud seeding experiment in the region using hygroscopic seeding flares at cloud base. We took regular aerosol measurements, and while that's not the focus of this talk, I'm going to mention that um, in a little bit about how we've used that to help constrain what, uh, our methods here. And then we also took in situ measurements in the cloud. Our cloud passes that we're going to call cloud base uh, measurements were made 300 to 600 meters above cloud base in developing convection to measure the initial drop size distribution. The reason why we have a little bit of a um, range here is because there is some topography in the region and due to flight restrictions, sometimes we were not always able to fly right at the 300 meters above cloud base. Sometimes we had to fly a little bit higher than that, but we've constrained it to that range to try to prevent any natural broadening that could have occurred if we took measurements too much higher. And these cloud-based passes were conducted immediately after the randomized seeding ended. So whether or not the cloud was seeded, we always ascended up in just above cloud base to take these initial droplet spectra measurements. Unfortunately, in the Queensland program, we did not have the capability to emit and measure a tracer in the flare material. So we're not going to be able to look directly at plumes that had been affected by seeding. But what we've done here is we're trying to take somewhat of a statistical approach to our analysis, and I'll describe that more in a moment. Um, the, the basis for this statistical analysis that we're doing, though, is based on the hygroscopic cloud seeding conceptual model. And the idea here is that rain formation begins when water molecules um, condense on naturally occurring nuclei and produce a distribution of small cloud droplets. Typically, in a more continental or polluted scenario, you would end up having a more narrow droplet spectra. Um, maybe in a more clean environment, a maritime environment, you would end up having a broader spectra. Then the next step for precipitation to form is the collision and coalescence process, where the larger droplets will fall faster relative to the smaller ones and start collecting those smaller droplets and grow to precipitation sized droplets. However, this typically doesn't occur until you have at least 20 to 30 micron sized droplets. 
And so the idea with hygroscopic seeding is, is that we hope to accelerate the collision and coalescence process to produce rain by burning hygroscopic flares in this particular scenario at cloud base that release these hygroscopic nuclei that would then help form larger droplets that could be the, the larger droplets that would start um, colliding and coalescing to form the warm rain process. So the idea here is that a, if a continental narrow droplet spectra, it should be more re responsive to hygroscopic seeding than a droplet spectra that's naturally broader that might already have those larger nuclei present. So we've used our aerosol measurements in a back trajectory model to characterize different aerosol regimes in the region. And like I said, I'm not going to go into detail here on that. There is a poster tomorrow afternoon um, on these results and how we um, did that um, analysis. But what we've decided, what we've come up to the conclusion is that the idea here is that if, um, if, there, if you're under similar aerosol loading in a given aerosol regime, for example, the assumption is the droplet spectra should exhibit, exhibit similar characteristics if it's dependent on the aerosol nuclei in the, in the atmosphere. And so what we're looking for is if there's a st statistically significant difference between the natural unseeded spectra in a given aerosol regime and the seeded spectra in that regime, perhaps that could be attributed to seeding. So a quick um, background on this aerosol characterization, we used a back trajectory model, in particular the high split model here, and we empirically split the back trajectories into two aerosol regimes, continental and maritime, and these were based on the time history of that air trajectory, whether it was majority of time over land or over water. And again, the details of this are in the poster tomorrow. But the results, for example, here for the cloud condensation nuclei concentrations by regime are showing that the more maritime back trajectories had much cleaner uh, measurements, lower uh, CCN concentrations, while the more continental back trajectories had higher CCN concentrations, higher aerosol, and so forth. So we're focusing here on the droplet spectra. So then what we did is we categorized the clouds as continental or maritime based on those back trajectories calculated from the cloud-based location and altitude. And then here's where it gets a little tricky. Ideally, you want to look at that initial droplet spectra that would result from nucleation on all of the aerosol that you measured at cloud base. Um, but there can be effects as you um, fly through the cloud from entrainment and cloud edge effects and so forth. So determining that region in the cloud pass that would be the representative droplet spectra is not straightforward. And here we're presenting a couple different methods that we've tried to look at to compare that. But there are many other methods out in the literature that also need to be pursued. <clears throat> One of the most basic assumptions is that if you um, look for the maximum droplet concentration in your cloud pass, um, that assumption there is that in your adiabatic or near adiabatic core, you would be nucleating as many of the aerosol uh, nuclei as possible, so you would have your highest droplet concentration. So for this method, we looked at the maximum droplet concentration, and in order to avoid the influence of data spikes, which can also is a caveat to this method, um, we looked at a mean of the three 1 hertz measurements plus or minus one second surrounding that maximum. Uh, we looked at the co concentrations in spectra at that time, and we called that one the maximum method. We also um, used a more subjective method, which we're calling the steady state method, where in the cloud, if you find periods of somewhat steady droplet concentrations that aren't fluctuating wildly due to spikes and stuff like that, that are high concentrations and high liquid water content periods, that you might be in that near adiabatic or adiabatic core. And so we took a mean over those periods where we had fairly steady measurements for this particular method. So let me first familiarize you with what I'm presenting because the next two slides are going to look just like this for each of the two methods. The table on the top, the top two rows are for maritime regime and the bottom two are for the continental regime. The shaded boxes are for unseeded spectra and the unshaded boxes are for the seeded spectra. So these are various statistics that we calculated from these spectra measurements. Um, we've looked at the concentration, the maximum concentration, and the average of those over each of these categories, unseeded, seeded for each regime, as well as the mean diameter and the concentration of drops larger than 20 microns. If you recall, I mentioned that that size threshold of larger drops than 20 microns is kind of the important um, size range for collision coalescence to start happening. And what we're seeing in this particular result is that actually in both of our maritime and continental regimes, if you look at the bottom panels, maritime on the left, continental on the right, solid lines are unseated and the dashed lines are seated 
these are the mean spectra for each of those populations. We're actually seeing a tail of larger drops in the seeded cases on average in both the maritime and continental regimes. The other thing that is <clears throat> a little bit confusing about this particular method in, our, in these particular results is if you look at the concentrations of the unseeded spectra um, for maritime and continental, they're actually quite similar and the continental is actually less. This is counterintuitive to what we found in our aerosol results. And so one of the things that we're concluding about this method is that it probably is still highly um, influenced by data spikes. Um, it's not representative of what we would have expected from our aerosol analysis. But I will say in the continental regime, um, our um, spectral measurements in both the unseeded and the seeded categories were very consistent. Um, the, the other thing that's interesting about these in both mean diameter and the um, concentration of drops greater than 20 microns, the, 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 um, the difference between the unseeded and seeded was actually fairly significant um, for the continental ones. And this is owing to the fact that our measurements in that regime were actually quite consistent, whereas in the maritime regime they were much more variable. If we look at the same thing for the steady state method, we can see now that, again, we're seeing in the continental regime that tail of larger drops and also um, larger mean diameters on average for the seeded, for the seeded spectra than the unseeded spectra. Um, and these are highly significant this time, whereas in the maritime regime we're not seeing that. And this is, to some extent, what we kind of expected to see. We did not expect to see as much of a response in the maritime regime because they typic these um, natural spectra, spectra typically already had a tail of larger drops, you know, up a greater than 20 microns. Um, so again, this is what we were thinking that we might see, and in both of these methods, this was a fairly common result. So to summarize, we've used the aerosol regimes from an independent analysis to statistically compare the initial droplet spectra in seeded and unseeded clouds. Uh, the droplet spectra in the continental regime exhibited a much broader spectra, including that tail of larger drops and even a larger mean diameter in the seeded cases compared to the non-seeded. This shift was fairly significant in both the max and especially the steady state methods that we've used so far. And this could be a sign of the first step of the hygroscopic seeding hypothesis taking place in that the flares are helping broaden the droplet spectra, especially in the um, situations where you would expect a more narrow spectra naturally. Um, however, the confusing aspect of this analysis so far is that our droplet spectra in the maritime regime were um, highly variable and dependent upon the calculation method. Some of our future work for this would be to test the other droplet spectra calculation methods. Like I mentioned, there are other methods in the literature to try to compare, um, to try to gain access to that near adiabatic or adiabatic core when you pass through a cloud. Um, we also need to determine what's actually happening in the maritime regime, why our res um, results are a little bit um, counterintuitive, especially since they were dependent on the calculation method. And the last step is we'd like to use a parcel model as an attempt to kind of simulate these results and, and corroborate um, some of the observational analysis. One other thing that I did forget to mention too is even though we are seeing this tendency for a possible shift of larger, a tail of larger drops, that doesn't say anything about how this is affecting precipitation on the ground. This is that first step in the hygroscopic seeding conceptual model. And I think Masataka mentioned yesterday in some of their hygroscopic flare seeding simulations and cloud shaper work that they're not seeing that um, effect all the way through to precipitation on the ground. But um, I'll take any questions. Actually, let me acknowledge our sponsor and our field project personnel who worked long hours, and I'll take any questions. The, uh, of the spectra, uh, in, especially in the continental clouds, uh, would uh, achieve the, uh, to be very similarly if you consistently or, or, a more, uh, or if you had the bias of uh, flying uh, at higher level uh, during the seeded cases compared to the non-seeded case. The range of 300 to 600 uh, meters above uh, cloud base makes a huge difference in the relative mm -hmm. uh, uh, drop size distribution. <coughs> uh, did you look at uh, any possible bias with respect to your uh, flight level with respect to uh, distance above cloud base? 
Yes, uh, not in this particular analysis. In the analysis that I've been doing for the aerosol, maritime versus continental characterization, we looked at that. The, that is an effect that could affect the maritime regime because in the maritime regime we had much lower cloud base heights and so typically our cloud bases could be lower than the terrain height. And so it typically was an effect where we had to fly higher in the maritime regime. So there might be a slight bias there. The interesting thing though is in our continental regime that bias wasn't as evident. So, but that is a very, very good point that in an ideal world we would have liked to have all of our measurements at the exact same height. We've tried to constrain that range as much as possible in order to try to limit that effect because some of our cloud-based measurements ended up being higher than 600 meters above cloud base. It really just depended on, on the terrain and where that cloud base was at on a given day. But that's a very good point. I would like to see that, uh, that actually being checked explicitly and not just by... Uh, Yeah, like I said, it hasn't been done for the seating, but for the, for the other one, we have looked at that already so far. One more question, Bruce. Very quickly, uh, Sarah, uh, you mentioned the, uh, the availability of dual-pole Doppler or dual-pole data. Mm -hmm. uh, are there any signatures or anything you can see from the radar data at this point, or you haven't gone that far? We've been doing some, di some separate radar analyses, but not so much with the dual Doppler yet. That's future work. <laughs> There's a lot to be done still with the data set that we have, yeah. I need to move on here.